The Great Lakes, a fishing and recreational paradise. Nearly 20% of all fresh water on the surface of our planet is here. It is a magnet for millions of tourists, as well as commercial and recreational fishers who pour billions of dollars into the region's economy. But there is something lurking beneath the placid surface of these waters that threatens the fishing, the fun, the economy, the very future of this precious natural resource. There's a predator in paradise. This ancient predator is more than 300 million years old, older than the dinosaurs. It entered the Great Lakes through man-made shipping canals in the early part of the 20th century. This invader is an aggressive parasitic marine animal with the scientific name Petromyzin marinus, but commonly called the sea lamprey. Sea lampreys are vampire-like killers that look like an alien creature from a late-night horror movie. Using a tooth-rimmed suction cup mouth, lampreys attach themselves to a fish, rip a hole through the victim's skin with their raspy tongue, and literally suck their prey's life out. In a span of less than 25 years, sea lampreys devastated the Great Lakes fishery. They feasted on prized large native fish, like lake trout, until by the late 1950s when these prized species of native fish were on the brink of extinction. The story you are about to hear is about how science, hard work, and a little luck brought this aquatic menace under control. Although we have them under control for the moment, sea lampreys remain a clear and present danger to the ecology and economy of the Great Lakes Basin. These are tenacious, exotic predators who, unfortunately, found the Great Lakes to be a fantastic new home, attacking sport and commercial species and shaking the foundations of fishing communities. Without constant vigilance, the destruction of the Great Lakes fishery that occurred because of sea lampreys will be repeated, a tragedy which cannot be allowed to be repeated. Sea lampreys are a primitive, jawless creature. While they resemble the Native American eel, they are not related. They have gills, but lack the paired fins found on most fish. They are vertebrates, but their skeletal structure consists only of cartilage, not bones, just like a shark. Their tail is broad and flat like a paddle. They swim through the water with a snake-like motion. Lampreys can grow to 51 centimeters or 20 inches in length and weigh up to a third of a kilogram or three quarters of a pound. Lampreys are unusual in that they start life with a larval stage that metamorphoses into the parasitic form that is so damaging. The sea lamprey's most remarkable feature, though, is only present once it enters the parasitic phase. It is a tooth-studded suction cup-like oral disc used to secure the lamprey to its prey while feeding. Hundreds of sharp teeth on the rim of the oral disc provide a death grip. Once attached to their prey, these teeth make it very difficult for even the biggest of fish to dislodge the lamprey. Lampreys use a razor-sharp tongue to rasp a hole through their victim's skin and suck their blood and body fluids. The lamprey's saliva contains a special enzyme that stops the fish's blood from clotting. Being a top predator, they consume a wide variety of Great Lakes fish while few things prey on them. Mature adult sea lampreys produce large numbers of eggs, which guarantees more parasitic adult feeders. Lastly, lampreys locate viable streams for spawning using a pheromone or odor excreted by native and non-native lamprey larvae. When detected by an adult, the pheromone signals that a stream contains both good spawning grounds and good habitat for larvae. To map out an effective strategy for controlling sea lampreys, scientists first had to understand their complex life cycle. In spring or early summer, adults leave the deep water of the Great Lakes and move into tributaries where they, in clean gravel with flowing water, excavate depressions and build nests. Lampreys use their sucker mouth and whole body to move large stones, some outweighing the lamprey by more than two times. 
With these stones, they build a horseshoe-shaped nest. The ancient Greeks observed this curious behavior and named these creatures petromyzen, or stone suckers. The lamprey's unique mouth is also used in its mating ritual. The male sucks onto the back of the female's head while the two vibrate together, releasing sperm and eggs. Adult sea lampreys die after mating. The female will lay between 25,000 and 100,000 eggs. In about 21 days, as many as 6,000 of the fertilized eggs will hatch. When hatched, the small worm-like young are blind, toothless, and harmless. These larvae are called amicetes. Amicetes drift downstream in search of slower currents and sand or silt bottoms to establish burrows. They will live in these burrows for the next three to five years. Amicetes have a mouth called an oral hood. To feed, they draw water into the burrow to filter microorganisms, algae, and organic matter out of the water. Once the filter-feeding amicetes have grown to about 12 centimeters or 5 inches, they undergo an amazing metamorphosis. They go through a transformation, developing eyes, while the harmless oral hood changes into the distinctive tooth-ringed sucker mouth. This begins the predatory phase that makes them a menace. The sea lamprey is now ready to enter the Great Lakes, where it will spend the next 12 to 20 months feeding on fish. Sea lampreys once inhabited only the open oceans. By 1835, they had moved into Lake Ontario through man-made canals. Their progress was halted by Niagara Falls. It would seem our sea lamprey problem would have ended right there. So how then did they make it past Niagara Falls, allowing them to infest the other four Great Lakes? Niagara Falls, a natural barrier to the invading sea lampreys, was bypassed by the construction of the Welland Canal. Beginning in 1913, the Welland Canal underwent a series of construction projects to widen and deepen it. For the sea lamprey, these modifications were enough to allow access to Lake Erie and the Upper Great Lakes. Sea lampreys were first seen in Lake Erie in 1921. Lakes Huron and Michigan by 1937, and Lake Superior by 1939. The invasion was complete. In its original ocean habitat, sea lampreys have been known to attack swordfish, bluefin tuna, even basking sharks. It is not hard to imagine what they can do to the smaller prey of the Great Lakes. It is estimated that between 40 and 60 percent of all lake trout that are attacked by sea lampreys die from loss of blood or lethal wounds. The lamprey's favorite prey? Lake trout, salmon, and whitefish. But sea lampreys can be indiscriminate hunters. Combined with over-harvest from commercial fishing, the ecological and economic impact of this all-too-efficient predator contributed to the collapse of the Great Lakes fishing industry in the 1940s and 50s. Before the invasion, the U.S. and Canada harvested an average of 7 million kilograms or 15 million pounds of lake trout per year on Lakes Huron and Superior alone. But by the 1960s, as sea lamprey populations exploded, Lake trout harvest was down to just 136,000 kilograms, or about 300,000 pounds. What followed were 20 years of record lows in fish populations. When lampreys were at their peak, 85% of all large Great Lakes fish exhibited sea lamprey wounds. The result amounted to an ecological and economic chain reaction crash. With fewer lake trout eating alewives, another invasive fish in the Great Lakes, the alewife population exploded and their massive annual die-offs fouled many Great Lakes beaches in the 50s and 60s. With the beaches fouled, the tourists stayed away. With no tourists, tourism-related jobs suffered. Shoreline communities became undesirable places to visit or live. The bottom line? Nearly 100,000 tourism-related jobs and a lucrative fishing industry were in trouble. Clearly, something had to be done to recover from the disaster. 
The Great Lakes are a shared resource. The impact of sea lamprey predation on the fishery was a Canadian and U.S. problem. In 1955, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, or GLFC, was formed under a treaty between Canada and the United States with the purpose of restoring the fisheries. The GLFC carries out its programs in partnership with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Department of State, and other partner agencies. The Commission's mandate? Finding a way to control sea lampreys. The first thing the GLFC tried was to deny sea lampreys access to their spawning grounds by the use of mechanical and electrical devices. These initial efforts were ultimately considered too hazardous or ineffective. Effective control depends on exploiting vulnerabilities in the sea lamprey's life cycle to prevent creation of the next generation. The Commission believed that sea lampreys were most vulnerable as larvae living in stream bottoms. In the 1950s, more than 6,000 compounds were tested in search of one that was selectively toxic that would kill lampreys while leaving the rest of the fish population unharmed. Researchers, in fact, found two. The first, in 1958, was 3-trifluoromethyl-4-nitrophenol, often simply referred to as TFM. A second compound, dichloro-4-nitrosalicylanolide, was found in 1964 to make TFM even more effective when added in small amounts. It is commonly known as balicide. Used in combination, TFM and balicide provide an effective treatment program to control lampreys. Before treatments can begin, assessment teams survey the streams and tributaries. Using electrofishing equipment, biologists and technicians shock larvae out of their burrows to determine the magnitude of sea lamprey infestation. After the assessments are complete and prior to treatment, parameters such as stream discharge and water chemistry are measured to determine the proper concentration of lamprecide to kill sea lampreys. After application is complete, Lamprecides rapidly degrade. The TFM treatment program is a massive undertaking. There are nearly 5,800 streams and tributaries on the Great Lakes. More than 400 of them are known to produce sea lampreys, and several hundred are treated on a regular cycle every three to five years. All are examined on a periodic basis for the presence of sea lamprey larvae. Lamprecides are not the only weapon in the sea lamprey control arsenal. The GLFC and its partners also exploit the lamprey as they return to streams to spawn. Barriers, natural and man-made, deny sea lampreys access to their spawning grounds above the barrier. These inaccessible areas are safe and don't need to be treated with lamprecides. Since sea lampreys are poor swimmers and can't jump, a low head barrier is an extremely effective tool in preventing access to spawning areas upstream. Most jumping fish have no trouble navigating low head barriers. Many other fish are passed manually. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission and its partners have constructed about 70 barriers throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Hundreds of other barriers built privately for industry, flood control, recreation, and other reasons provide additional protection from these invaders. New technologies like this inflatable barrier and stop log barriers are adjustable depending on the time of year or stream condition. During the spawning run, they are raised to stop sea lampreys from moving upstream to reproduce and lowered at other times to allow the streams to flow naturally. The Commission and its partners operate a network of sea lamprey traps throughout the Great Lakes Basin to control sea lamprey and measure the effectiveness of the control effort. Balicide is applied precisely to lamprey hotspots on the river. New cutting-edge technologies for sea lamprey control are being used and others are on the horizon.
For example, remember those pheromones? Scientists are studying how these chemical road markers can be used to lure sea lampreys into traps. Uh, we were successful in identifying one component of the sea lamprey mating pheromone and uh, were able to synthesize it and then test it in many streams uh, and just put it into sea lamprey traps to see if we can catch more sea lampreys. We're testing it right now in 20 streams that historically have trapped sea lampreys and indications are that we're catching more lampreys and the overall trap efficiencies are increased. Other cutting-edge research uses genomic information to find ways to disrupt the sea lamprey life cycle or exploit other weaknesses. Scientists hope, for example, to understand what causes sea lamprey larvae to transform into a killer. Native Great Lakes lampreys have a life cycle similar to sea lampreys, but are small and they co-evolved with other Great Lakes fishes. In stark contrast, the non-native sea lampreys are much larger than native lampreys, and having few predators in the Great Lakes are strikingly lethal to Great Lakes fish. Managing sea lampreys is no easy task. They live in a 475,000 square kilometer or 295,000 square mile watershed, the largest freshwater lake system in the world. Scientists know that it would be impossible to kill every sea lamprey within our five Great Lakes and thousands of rivers and streams. However, the Sea Lamprey Program, with its goal to drastically reduce sea lamprey populations, is a huge success. What we have here is a screw trap, and this is one of the tools we use in, in assessment. In this case, we're assessing uh, the juvenile lamprey as they are out migrating on their way out to the lakes to start feeding. And so we're going to try and intercept as many as we can. And we also use this tool to, to evaluate how well of a job we did at estimating their population numbers. Sea lamprey populations have been slashed by an astounding 90% in many areas of the Great Lakes. The goal of the GLFC is to keep the momentum moving. Today, the sea lamprey population is under control. But more than 50 years of successful sea lamprey management has demonstrated the need for continued action and vigilance to reduce lamprey populations throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Given even a small chance, this aquatic vampire has proven it can easily come back. A sea lamprey resurgence to former levels is not an option. This management effort is a sound investment. The Great Lakes fishery is worth more than $7 billion annually to the people of Canada and the United States. The money spent on sea lamprey control is returned to the Great Lakes economy through better commercial fishing and improved recreation and tourism. The environment is healthier and the ecosystem is returning to a more natural balance. Sea lampreys are under control for now, but the predator is still among us.